welcome to hindu news analysis by shankar ias academy dear aspirants we have an announcement regarding prefit and also few clarifications see our academy is launching a special program called prefit to help the aspirants to navigate the timeline for the run up to upcoming prelims exam the entrance exam for joining this initiative will be conducted online on 7th february 2021 Many students have asked us whether they can write the exam in their mobile phones. Yes, you can appear for this exam using your mobile phones. Regarding the payment for entrance exam, we have received many requests from various aspirants to waive the fee for the entrance exam. Therefore, our academy has decided to make the entrance exam completely free. So you are not supposed to pay any money for appearing the entrance exam. and talking about the highlights of this program the academy will provide a micro schedule along with high intensity interval training for prelims exam the program is modeled on the scientific principle of active recall and spaced repetition to ensure maximum output the aspirants will solve around 4000 questions in the period from february 15th to may 16th so during this period the participants would be given 50 questions on a daily basis on 6 days a week the 50 questions will be based on the micro schedule and each test will be followed by a daily detailed discussion under this program students will develop a daily routine specific to prelims preparation we have also used gamification principles to incentivize regular test taking and improvement of performance In order to ensure that participants should qualify the CSAT paper which is becoming difficult every year the prefit includes a CSAT test of 50 questions every week the program also covers current affairs prefit divides current affairs of past one year into monthly or weekly as well as daily targets these targets will be covered across multiple tests before we head to hindu news analysis one clarification this program is completely different from shankar ais academy's pre storming that is prelims test series if you are already writing pre storming you can still join this program so how does this pre fit work firstly the entrance exam will be conducted on 7th february that is coming sunday the syllabus for entrance exam is upsc prelims syllabus for gs and csat paper Participation in the entrance exam is completely free but you have to register by visiting the link which is in description and also in the comment section. Students who secure top 100 ranks will be eligible for Prefit Prime. Under this the top 100 rankers will be given 50% subsidized monthly fee structure of rupees 750. Students other than Prefit Prime will have a monthly fee structure of rupees 1500. Subsequent months of access to Prefit Prime will be subject to securing a position in the top 100 in the previous month. Students who secure a position in Prefit Prime will also be eligible to avail 25% concession in main storming 2021 if they qualify in prelims 2021. So hurry up guys just fill your details in the registration form and appear for the test on coming sunday with this let us move on to today's news analysis the list of news articles along with the page numbers is given here for your reference see this article from editorial page titled it's goodbye to fiscal orthodoxy this article is regarding the new budget released a day before yesterday yesterday we had a very comprehensive discussion on budget wherein we talked about what is budget what are the highlights and even what are the shortcomings if you recollect yesterday we have talked about fiscal deficit and we also said that the fiscal deficit for the current year that is 2020 2021 and the next year that is 2021 2022 is way high so the author is talking about this fiscal deficit it and government's idea of spending more that is borrowing more and spending more which means high fiscal deficit for this reason the article is titled it's goodbye to fiscal orthodoxy let us get into the article before that the relevant syllabus is given here for your reference see firstly the finance ministry has pegged the fiscal deficit of the current year at 9.5% of gdp whenever we talk about fiscal deficit we'll be telling 3% 4% 5% it means the fiscal deficit is being compared with gdp so when we say 9.5% it means 9.5% of india's gdp and for the next year the fd is projected at 6.8% so almost 3% reduction so most of us know this fiscal deficit means when government spends more than what it receives it leads to some deficit that is more spending less earning that deficit is called fiscal deficit see there is some act called uh, frbm act fiscal responsibility and budget management act this act was enacted in 2003 to establish a financial and fiscal discipline to reduce the fiscal deficit 
See, previously, whenever there is an election, government will spend more. It will give a lot of freebies, a lot of schemes, mainly to get votes. So, generally, in election years, the fiscal deficit will be increasing like anything. So, to bring more discipline to union government in 2003, this act was enacted. So, according to the current act after amendments, it says that government has to limit the fiscal deficit to 3% of GDP by 2021, that is the current year. But in February 2020, Centre has raised this target to 3.8%. But now the next budget proposes a FD target which is way higher than what was targeted. That is 6.8% is the prediction for next year. So this is why the author is saying that government is spending like there is no tomorrow. It means it is spending more. The author also says that the budget does not provide fiscal deficit indicators for the past years as well as projections for the next years. Generally what government does is, it will give the targets for every year. So how much the fiscal deficit will be limited in the next year and the next year. So next three to four years it will give targets so that how it is going to comply to the FRBM Act. But the new budget has not given any such predictions. It means that there is no clear plan to achieve the targets set by FRBM Act in the coming days. So it is both good and bad. Why good? Because due to COVID-19 lockdown, the growth in India and across the world has diminished. To improve the growth, we need more spending. So if there are targets or limitations, it will be difficult for government to spend more. So it is good. Why bad? If there is no control, government will spend like anything and it may lead to debt unsustainability. That is, we cannot service our debt. Next, author is also of the view that government is selectively departing from market orthodoxy or market economics. So what is a market economy and why is government departing from market economy? See first market economy means an economic system where economic decisions and the pricing of goods services are guided by interactions of citizens and businesses. Simply put demand and supply. Government will not have much say about it which is also called laissez-faire. So how is government departing from this? See for example government has increased duties on some imports to protect the domestic industry. It has also introduced performance linked incentives that is PLI scheme for certain sectors. For example electronics manufacturing we are having a PLI scheme. So we are promoting Indian based products at the expense of foreign inputs. This is against the market economy. At the same time government follows other elements of market orthodoxy such as privatization and greater role of foreign direct investment. So one side it is departing from the market economy by impacting the demand and supply. On the other side it is following market orthodoxy that is privatization and greater role for FDIs. So another important point mentioned by the author is government's departure from Washington consensus. So what is this Washington consensus? See it refers to a set of free market economic policies supported by prominent financial institutions like IMF, World Bank, US Treasury etc. So this term was coined by British economist John Williamson. We don't need to learn about what is this consensus but the most important tenet of this consensus is macroeconomic stability. So which means the macroeconomic indicators like growth rate, fiscal deficit, revenue deficit, they should be stable. So the government budget need to be broadly in balance so that borrowings to finance the deficit are kept to minimum. And if you see the economic survey also mentions departure from fiscal consolidation. We have talked about economic survey in our 30th Jan video. If you have any doubts regarding economic survey, please watch that video. So in this context, the author is apprehensive that if deficit targets are not controlled, the public debt might become unsustainable in the future. If there is no target, government may borrow more and spend more. But it is imperative to note that the spend more mantra is not just followed by India. See in the wake of COVID-19, both the IMF and the World Bank have been asking the advanced economies to spend more to push the growth rate ahead. See IMF and World Bank are important supporters of Washington consensus. But despite this, they are asking governments to spend more by allowing deficits even if it is crossing 100% of GDP. See on Jan 30th, we have talked about economic survey and we have discussed something called counter cyclical fiscal policy and accordingly government is spending more that is expansionary fiscal policy. So government is saying that when government increases the money supply in the economy, it will boost the growth. This will result in lower debt to GDP ratio. Simply the debt to GDP ratio will be decreased. How? To spend more, government needs to borrow more, then debt will be increased. But government is saying that even though it is spending more, the debt to GDP ratio will be decreased. 
here note that debt to GDP ratio that is numerator is debt denominator is GDP we are increasing the numerator but it will lead to increase in growth which means the denominator will also be increased so if you are increasing the denominator that is GDP automatically the debt to GDP ratio will come down but here author highlights one risk see if government is borrowing more that is increasing the public debt the credit rating agencies may downgrade India's ratings and if you remember in our economic survey video we clearly talked about the ratings biasedness towards India so when ratings are poor it will severely affect the foreign direct investment into the country another concern is that a large FD can fuel a rise in inflation when government spends more the money in the economy will increase so people will be having more money automatically demand will rise when demand is more inflation will be there which is called demand pull inflation so the increasing FD may also lead to increasing inflation and in the last one year because of COVID-19 caused inflation inflation was almost above the target limits of RBI which is 4 plus or minus 2 percent so when government is going for expansionary fiscal policy this target should also be rationalized but the budget is silent on this aspect and not just that even our tax to GDP ratio is not rising as expected see in the financial year 20 that is last financial year India's tax GDP ratio decreased it to 9.8 percent so this was the lowest in last 10 years so in this scenario the only possible way to reduce fiscal deficit is the sale of public assets that is disinvestment so generally government gets money to taxation if it is not getting enough money through taxation it has to get money through disinvestment but in the last few years even revenue from disinvestment is falling short of targets so this strategy is risky as large scale privatization is not easy in India because there are issues like corruption for favoring certain industrial houses job losses concerns raised by employees union in those industries so these issues are even making difficult for government to disinvest Further, privatization or disinvestment will involve more FDA, that is, more foreign presence in domestic economy. But this goes against the vision of Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which means greater self reliance and stronger Indian companies. So, if you are increasing FDA and many foreign companies are coming into India, then our vision of self reliant India will be difficult to achieve. So we can conclude by saying that though departure from FRBM targets in this difficult period is welcomed, government should have a sustainable debt management strategy or simply it should have a fiscal consolidation strategy. So have an idea on all these issues. We have talked about different issues caused due to expansionary fiscal policy and we also talked about Washington consensus, a prelims bit and what are the problems regarding disinvestment. Let us move on to next news article discussion. See this news article from page 1 which talks about the decision of High Court of Delhi in Future Group Reliance deal. As you all know, there is a tussle going on between Amazon and uh, Future Groups over Future Reliance deal. So Future Group wants to sell its business to Reliance Retail, that is Mukesh Ambani's Reliance. But the problem here is Amazon is having some stake in one of the Future Group companies and they have some clause wherein if future group wants to sell shares Amazon should be offered first or Amazon should give consent to the future group to sell its assets as future group and reliance proceeded with the deal without the consent of Amazon Amazon took this dispute to Singapore Arbitration International Center which passed an interim order in favor of Amazon and also restrained future group from proceeding with the deal so Amazon has filed a plea against future group to stop the transfer of retail assets but future group has objected the arbitrator's enforcements on various grounds now in this light amazon has approached delhi high court which said that the singapore arbitration order can be enforced in india which is a major relief to amazon all these business issues are not required in the exam perspective but what we are going to see today is arbitration which is an alternative dispute resolution mechanism see when issue came between amazon and future group they didn't go to court they went to something called arbitration center why we'll try to understand see generally any person wishes to resolve their disputes through a cheap flexible and substantive judicial process but unfortunately it is not happening at least in India we are seeing lot of pendency in cases almost crores of cases are pending in India if you see this data point it talks about justice delayed in many high courts the judge positions are vacant to one extent 70 percent of high court judge positions are vacant in AP in UP, 38% of subordinate court judge positions are also vacant as of 2018-2019. 
even coming to case pendency as you can see the cases pending for more than 10 years are high in maharashtra gujarat odisha bihar west bengal which are all the big states in india and if you see this figure it says that in many states pending on the judiciary has not kept pace with the increase in overall state expenditure and as you can see only states like tamil nadu gujarat kerala are doing little better and much of the states are below this line meaning it is in negative so it can be understood that the judicial process in india is delayed for years and even decades in some cases so this has led to the development of an alternative to court system popularly known as alternative dispute resolution mechanism as the name suggests it is alternative to traditional process of dispute resolution through courts so it consists of a set of practices and techniques to resolve disputes outside the courts so this mechanism involves parties themselves to settle their disputes in a friendly manner which is not possible generally through courts so adr mechanisms are mostly related to civil cases only and not for criminal cases coming to types of adr mechanisms it include arbitration conciliation mediation and negotiation and there is one unique feature in india which is lok adalat which combines different techniques like conciliation mediation and negotiation So coming to arbitration here the dispute is submitted to an arbitral tribunal which will make a decision on the dispute and as we said before in the dispute between future group and amazon they both went to singapore international arbitration center and the decision made is mostly binding on the parties so though it resembles the courtroom based settlement it involves less procedure and generally there is no right to appeal on arbitrator's decision even judicial intervention in this process also very limited except for some interim measures next is conciliation in this process the disputed parties with help of conciliator or neutral third person will study the issue and will arrive at a mutual settlement in this method the conciliator would investigate on the issue and will draft a report on the methods of settlement here the report is not binding generally we see this in our families whenever there is a problem a common friend will come and try to resolve the issue then comes mediation here the dispute between the parties will be settled with the help of a mediator here the mediator will not decide but instead will just help the party in reaching an agreement here the final decision will be made by both the parties generally we do mediation with our friends Similarly in negotiation the disputing parties will settle the dispute among themselves without the aid of third person or negotiator even if a negotiator is involved his role would be limited so bargaining is a common feature of negotiation process so both sides will discuss and compromise on few aspects and settle the issue peacefully so these are the four main types of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms and as we said before there is an invention called uh, lok adalat in india which is a unique system as it involves uh, different techniques like conciliation mediation and also negotiation so this lok adalat or people's court is a forum where disputes pending in the court or even at pre litigation stage can be settled or compromised Lok adalats are statutorily recognized under Legal Services Authorities Act of 1987. Also as per this act the award made by Lok Adalat is deemed to be a decree of civil court and the decision is final and binding on the parties. And importantly no appeal can be made against the Lok Adalat order in any court of law. But Supreme Court has said that the award of Lok Adalat can be challenged only under Article 226 that is writ jurisdiction of high court. but importantly know that if the parties are not satisfied with the award of lok adalat though there is no provision for appeal they can go back to court it means they can start litigation back in court again so they cannot appeal lok adalat award but they can start the litigation process in normal courts so this is all about the discussion of this news article we had a brief discussion on future reliance deal we talked about different mechanisms of adr and we have also seen the data of judicial vacancies and judicial pendency in our country with this let us move on to next news article see this news articles one editorial another oped are with reference to recent military coup which happened in myanmar see uh, last monday myanmar's military seized power against the democratically elected government of aung san suu kyi So Aung San Suu Kyi is the current democratically elected leader of Myanmar and military after seizing the power detained the democratically elected leader along with other leaders of her party the reason cited by army was that the general elections happened in November had several irregularities 
See the Suki's NLD party swept the polls by winning almost 80% of the vote, while the army backed Union Solidarity and Development Party suffered a humiliating defeat. And in this regard, the USDP did not accept the result and also military raised a lot of concerns. So military supported the allegations of fraud without offering any evidence and now it turned a partial democracy which is in Myanmar into a full-fledged military rule again. So before understanding why military did this and what the foreign powers are saying, let us have a brief understanding of Myanmar's recent political history. Though this is not much important in exam perspective, if you know the history, it will be easy to correlate the events. See, Myanmar became independent from British in 1948 into a sovereign independent republic and a new constitution was written. Since then it practiced the democracy ideology under General Aung San. Aung San is the father of current uh, Suki. However, its democracy system faced problems when a coup happened in 1962. And since then, Myanmar practiced a self-imposed isolation policy from the rest of the world. But this resulted in vast political, social and economical unrest in late 1980s. And because of this, people started questioning the military regime. So a democracy system was proposed and election happened in 1990. And then the popular leader Aung San Suu Kyi won the election in 1990. But military was not ready then to accept the defeat. It arrested Suki and imposed military rule again. Since then, Myanmar has been facing sluggish economy and it got severed from external relations and lost its identity in the rest of the world. And then India's response was more fierce and more critical and it directly questioned the military rule in Myanmar. As public unrest continued to grow, there came another bout of massive anti-government protests in 2007 by Buddhist monks, which is popularly known as Saffron Revolution. So later in 2010, Junta, that is military leadership, proposed a new constitution with a quarter of seats being allocated to military. So one-fourth of seats of uh, parliament goes to military, three-fourth of seats to democratically elected leaders. But cleverly, military banned Suki from participating in the elections because Suki was more popular and she will definitely win the election. So they cleverly banned her from participating in the elections. In that year, the military-backed party, the USDP, won the elections. And after five years, that is in 2015, elections happened again. But this time, Suki rejoined the political process and she won the election and formed the government. But even then, there are many challenges because in Myanmar, military is so powerful. And if you remember, they even persecuted Rohingyas, that is Muslims in Myanmar. And because of this reason, lakhs of Rohingyas fled from Myanmar to Bangladesh and India. Even then, Suki didn't took a critical stand of army. In 2020 elections, Suki won again, but military is not happy about this. And one more reason is, the current military general, Min Aung Hlaing, is having president ambitions, which is not liked by the democratically elected leader, Aung San Suu Kyi. And the tenure of military general is about to expire this July. So, to continue his tenure and the power, it is said that army announced emergency and detained all the political leaders. And as said before, the reason stated by military is the voter fraud happened in 2020 elections, that too without any evidence. So what is the response from foreign powers? The UN Special Rapporteur on Myanmar stated that it is unacceptable and requires strong and unequivocal international response. So UN, say global body, has responsibly termed this coup as unacceptable. And even the new president, Joe Biden, had threatened to reimpose sanctions and called for an international response to press the military to relinquish the power. And coming to India, when coup happened in 1990, India had a very critical response to Myanmar. But this time, India is not directly criticizing the army. The reason is, India is having a very good relation with Myanmar military and Myanmar military helped India in reducing the insurgency in northeastern states. And when the Foreign Secretary of India visited Myanmar in last year, our Foreign Secretaries met both Aung San Suu Kyi, the democratically elected leader, and also the military general. So India understands the balance of power in Myanmar. India expressed deep concern regarding the coup. And as we said before, but this time India is cautious while dealing with issue because our security relationship with Myanmar military has become extremely close.
and if we threaten myanmar myanmar will definitely move towards china it is said that the myanmar military is supported by china and even this coup is also backed by china already india's neighbors for example nepal is moving towards china bangladesh is having problems with uh, citizenship amendment act if you come to sri lanka the current president and prime minister rajapaksa are already close to china pakistan and china are all weather friends and bhutan because of its proximity to india is facing heat from china in terms of territorial clashes so most of our neighbors are already close to china are moving close to china and now in this moment india cannot afford one more neighbor myanmar to china and not just that india is also having lot of interests in myanmar for example india considers myanmar as a bridge between south and southeast asia and it serves as a buffer between india and china so myanmar is strategically very important for india and there are many projects we are doing for example there is something called kaladan multimodal project and even bimstick myanmar is also a member and not just that if myanmar moves close to china china can easily access bay of bengal and threaten the regional security security in bay of bengal so because of all these reasons india is not taking a tough stand on this coup but latently it made sure that india is not happy with the coup happened in myanmar so let us see what india is going to do whether it strictly follows policy of non interference or will it engage with military as well as democratically elected leaders to make peace and revival of democracy in myanmar let us move on to next news article discussion See this question which is framed based on this news article which talks about Carnatic music and saint come composer Tyagaraja or Tyagaiya statement 1 unlike hindustani music which had persian and islamic influences carnatic music is more indigenous yes statement 1 is correct see basically indian music is divided into two systems hindustani in the north and carnatic in the south because of mughal rule and other aspects the hindustani music got influenced by persian and islam but carnatic music has been almost indigenous or pure indigenous for centuries so statement 1 is correct statement 2 tyagaraja is termed as carnatic sangeeta pitamaha To find out whether this statement is correct or incorrect, let us have a brief background of Carnatic music. See, South Indian music flourished in Devagiri, the capital city of Yadavas in the Middle Ages. But after the invasion of Mughals, the entire cultural life of city took shelter in Carnatic Empire of Vijayanagara Kingdom under the reign of the great ruler Sri Krishna Devaraya. So thereafter, the music of South India came to be known as Carnatic music. The great composer Purandara Dasa is termed as Carnatic Sangeeta Pitamaha or Grand Sire of Carnatic Music. So the statement 2 is incorrect. It is not Tyagaraja, it is Purandara Dasa. And also know that the birth of musical trinity led to an era of dynamic development in Carnatic music. So who are the 3% of this trinity? Tyagaraja or Tyagaiya, Muthuswami Dikshit and Syama Shastri. All of them were born at Tiruvarur in 18th and 19th centuries. So these three were not only contemporaries among themselves but also contemporaries of great composers of western music like Beethoven, Mozart, Wagner. So this period is generally considered as golden age of music throughout the world. And coming to elements of Carnatic music, they are Shruti, Swara, Raga and Tala. Major instruments used in Carnatic are tamburi, mridanga, violin, harmonium, flute, etc. And talking about today's news that is Tyagaraja Aradhana which celebrates the compositions of Saint Tyagaraja his works mostly devotional and dedicated to Lord Rama so Rama Bhakti he composed his divine kritis mostly in Telugu and among his many songs the famous are Pancharatna kritis meaning the five gems in five ragas they are given here you might have heard most of these songs and four of these are in telugu and one is in sanskrit so this is all about the discussion coming back to the question statement 2 is incorrect because it is not tyagaraja it is purandara dasa who is termed as carnatic sangeeta pitamaha coming to statement 3 tyagaraja muthuswami and syama shastri are known as trinity of carnatic music is yes, the statement 3 is correct as we are supposed to identify incorrect statements the correct answer is option b 2 only See this question which is framed based on this news article which talks about wetlands. The news is that on the occasion of World Wetlands Day a wetland manual for children was launched. See every year on 2nd February that is yesterday is celebrated as World Wetlands Day to raise global awareness about the vital role of wetlands for both people and our planet. So this day marks the date of adoption of Convention on Wetlands or Ramsar Convention 
as this convention was adopted on 2nd Feb of 1971 in Iranian city of Ramsar. So the name Ramsar Convention. And coming to current year's World Wetlands Day, the theme is wetlands and water. It highlights the importance of wetlands as a source of fresh water and encourages action to restore them and stop their loss. And we also said that a manual has been launched for children. Its name is Home of the Blue Lily, a manual on wetland ecology. So this was launched as an interactive module for children by Care Earth Trust along with Sweet Bio. Care Earth is an Indian institution while Sweet Bio is a program of Stockholm Resilience Center. It is a knowledge interface on resilience and development. So coming back to the question, statement 1, the definition of wetlands under wetland rules of 2017 does not include river channels, paddy fields and human made water bodies specifically constructed for drinking water purposes. See, Government of India has issued wetland rules in the year 2017 to manage the wetlands across the country. See, statement 1 is correct. See, according to Ramsar Convention, wetlands include floodplains, rivers, lakes, coastal areas like salt marshes, mangroves, peatlands, intertidal mudflats, coral reefs, human-made wetlands like dams, reservoirs, rice paddy fields. Almost all the water bodies are considered as wetlands according to Ramsar Convention. But if you see the wetland rules issued by India in 2017 does not include river channels, paddy fields, human-made water bodies, especially for drinking water purposes. And also structures like aquaculture, salt production, recreation, irrigation purposes. So all these areas do not come under India's definition of wetlands. So statement 1 is correct. Statement 2, Home of the Blue Lily is a manual on wetland ecology launched by UNEP. This statement is incorrect because we have seen that this manual was launched by Care Earth Trust and Sweet Bio and not by UNEP. So the correct answer is option A, one only. See this question which is framed based on this news article which talks about Jal Jeevan mission. See the news is the new budget has announced the urban water supply mission that is Jal Jeevan mission for urban areas. See the existing Jal Jeevan mission envisages supply of water to every rural household through functional household tap connections by 2024. So previously it was for rural areas, but the new budget proposes similar mission for urban areas as well. See as of now around 2.68 crore urban households are not having tap connections. The Jaljeevan Mission Urban is aiming at providing functional household tap connections to all these people in urban areas. This mission would include rejuvenation of water bodies to boost the sustainable freshwater supply and creation of green spaces. So broadly, this urban mission will promote circular economy of water through development of city water balance plan for each city focusing on recycle or reuse of treated sewage, rejuvenation of water bodies and water conservation. The ministry is aiming to meet 20% of demand through reused water. So it's like a water conservation and water reuse technique. Coming back to the question, Statement 1. It is a campaign for water conservation and water security in the country. This statement is incorrect because this statement is talking about Jal Shakti Abhiyan which is aiming to create awareness and behavior change across the country. As we have said, Jal Jeevan Mission is all about providing tap connections in the rural households. Statement 2. Community-led partnership with states or UTs will be the strategy for achieving the objectives of Jal Jeevan Mission. Yes, the statement 2 is correct. Statement 3. Grey water is one of the components of Jal Jeevan mission. Yes, statement 3 is also correct. In village piped water, reliable drinking water sources, removal of contaminants, grey water management are some of the important components under this scheme. So the correct answer is option A, one only since we are supposed to identify incorrect statements. Let us move on to practice questions discussion session. Consider the following statements about Lok Adalat. Statement 1. They enjoy statutory status under Legal Services Authorities Act of 1987. Yes, statement 1 is correct. Statement 2. There is no court fee payable when a matter is filed in a Lok Adalat. Yes, this statement is also correct because in Lok Adalats there is no concept of court fee. Interestingly, even if a matter pending in the court is referred to Lok Adalat and is settled subsequently, the court fee originally paid will also be refunded. So both the given statements are correct. So correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. See this question. Consider the following countries. 
five countries are given here china bangladesh thailand laos vietnam which of the above countries share border with myanmar as you can see in the map vietnam does not share border with myanmar in between myanmar and vietnam there is china as well as laos so if you remove number 5 from the options we can arrive at correct answer that is option b 1 2 3 4 only as you can see china on the top bangladesh on the left thailand on southeast laos on the east share border with Myanmar and obviously India is on the left of Myanmar. See this question. Consider the following countries: Libya, Chile, Thailand, Myanmar. Which of the above mentioned countries faced a military coup? You may find it difficult question, but if you know there has been a coup in the Myanmar, you can arrive at the answer. That is option D. One, two, three, four. The main question is given here. The restrictions imposed on government spending by FRBM Act 2003 will limit the economic growth in India in the post-pandemic period. analyze with this we conclude today's news analysis if you find this session resourceful click on the like button show your appreciation in the comment section and don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel